welcome Nicola Sturgeon here tonight to give the 2017 Political Studies Association Conference Dinner Speech. Thank you very much indeed, Matthew, for that introduction and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, here to the city uh, of Glasgow, to my home city of Glasgow. Uh, I hope you've had a wonderful time uh, here in Glasgow, in Scotland, over the past few days. I hope you've enjoyed the famous Scottish hospitality, although with regard to some of the famous Scottish hospitality, I hope you've enjoyed it in moderation, because overindulgence can lead to a sore head in the morning. Uh, but it is a huge pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, Scottish universities, of course, have been involved in the Political Studies Association from its very foundation back in 1950. And I know that Scotland has hosted this annual conference on several occasions, uh, most recently in 2010, during your 60th anniversary year. So I'm really delighted that you have again returned to Scotland and it is sincerely a huge pleasure to welcome all of you to Glasgow. It is a particular pleasure because the scale and the reach of this conference is truly impressive. You have been discussing issues from environmentalism to gender and politics, a subject quite close to my heart, to the design of parliaments and how they affect politics. Sessions are being held on political developments in different regions across the world, from North America to Southeast Asia. In many ways, and I say this absolutely sincerely, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to attend some of these sessions, because you are, without a shadow of a doubt, addressing issues that are of direct relevance to all politicians, not just in Scotland and the UK, but in Europe and across the world. But more importantly, you have been addressing issues that are of hugely important relevance to citizens right across our world. And I think one of the things which that demonstrates as all of us reflect on what I think I can safely describe with any fear of being accused of exaggeration as a pretty tumultuous 12 months in politics uh, right across the world is that the work of political studies specialists is perhaps more important and more valuable now than it has ever been before. And I think it's quite important to stress that point from the outset, because in the last year, I'm not sure you will always have felt that your work is appreciated by all politicians. Uh, one of the most notorious comments of the EU referendum uh, was, of course, that statement that the public have had enough of experts. And there has been a sense fueled by that referendum and also, I think, uh, by the US election that evidence-based arguments have somehow stopped being important in political campaigns and in public discourse. But actually, as all of us know, experts do make an important and positive difference not just to the academic understanding of political issues, but also to wider public debate and to the very health of our democracy. And I think that Scotland in many ways in recent years provides a good example of that. There are some very high profile examples of teams who have made it part of their mission to help the public and the media to understand issues better. For example, the Centre and Constitutional Change or the work on polling at Strathclyde University and through what Scotland thinks. Uh, all of these have had a real public impact. In fact, I often think that Professor John Curtis appears in television far more often than I do. Actually, Professor John Curtis does appear on television far more often than I do. But of course, there is excellence in all of the political studies teams in Scotland, and that's something that has been reflected in their contributions to this conference. Uh, their work, and I'm sure that this is also true of schools across the UK and around the world, doesn't simply meet rigorous academic standards. It also makes a real difference to the quality of our public discourse. And all of that 
is important and encouraging when we think about the current constitutional position here in Scotland and the prospect of a further referendum on Scottish independence, something that I know is of interest uh, much further afield than just here in Scotland. Uh, as most of you know, in 2014, uh, when we debated and voted on the issue of Scottish independence, uh, the European Union was a significant issue in that debate. Uh, many of those who opposed Scotland becoming an independent country, including the UK government, it has to be said, argued that leaving the UK was a risk. Uh, they said that it would threaten Scotland's place in the European Union. So it is somewhat ironic that the opposite has turned out to be true. Uh, Scotland, despite the arguments that were made in 2014 and indeed how we voted in 2016 when 62% of those who voted opted to remain in the European Union, it is therefore ironic that Scotland now faces being forced to leave the EU against our will. And of course we face not just being forced to leave but being forced out in a deeply damaging manner by a UK government that seems determined to prioritise control of migration over membership of the free market, thereby making a hard Brexit all but inevitable. And of course that presents Scotland with something of a dilemma. Uh, some people in Scotland entirely understandably are reluctant to have another referendum on independence in the next two years. However, if we don't have a referendum, if we don't give people of, of Scotland a choice, we will be accepting a course of action determined by a UK government that most people in Scotland uh, don't vote for and for a course of action that most people in Scotland didn't vote for. It is a course which may be deeply damaging to our economy and our society, perhaps for decades, possibly for generations to come. And in my view, that is democratically unacceptable. And that is why the Scottish Parliament just two weeks ago agreed to seek consent from the UK government for a further referendum on independence once the final terms of Brexit are known. To ensure that our future as a country, whatever that future turns out to be, is decided by us, not decided for us. So Scotland once again faces a time of intense political debate. And there are two points that I want to make about that this evening. And although I make these points in a Scottish context, I think they are applicable to elections and to referendums the world over. And perhaps given the climate that we currently live in, fueled sometimes by the polarizing effect of social media, where opinions uh, often matter much more than facts, uh, these points, I think, are worth underlining. And the first of those points is this, that it is important in the Scottish context, but in any context, that people asked to make a choice are able to make an informed choice. And in that respect, it's possibly worth comparing the 2014 referendum on independence with the 2016 referendum on EU membership. A key difference was that in 2014, the Scottish Government set out a detailed prospectus for how Scotland would become independent. Now, that plan was scrutinised, analysed, often criticised by political opponents, by the media, by business groups and wider civic society, and of course, by academics. That analysis, analysis wasn't always comfortable for the government and for those of us advocating independence. Of course, it wasn't but it was incredibly valuable. And it fed into a much wider public debate about what kind of country Scotland wanted to be, a debate that became extremely well informed. And it meant that in the summer of 2014, uh, genuinely detailed issues, issues like, for example, uh, who would be the lender of last resort for financial institutions in an independent Scotland, were not just being debated in the chamber of our parliament or on television by politicians and commentators and pundits. These issues were being discussed and debated in great detail in pubs and cafes, 
in hairdressers, at bus stops, in workplaces and homes, in every single part of the country. Uh, the Scottish population became engaged, educated and informed like never before. And that included young people, a legacy that lives on today, given the lowering of the voting age in the referendum to 16. Uh, something that in passing I would say if it had happened in the EU referendum, the result would have gone the other way. But in 2016, on the other hand, uh, people were asked to vote for a change without ever really being told what that change involved. A slogan on the side of a bus was as detailed as it ever got. Uh, and that detail on the side of the bus, of course, should never ever be confused with the truth. Nobody who wanted, and I think this is a, a key point and a key point of difference, uh, with the Scottish referendum where the Scottish government was one of the key proponents for change. In the EU referendum, nobody who wanted to leave the EU had any real responsibility for setting out how that might be achieved or what the implications were. Many big issues, for example, the difference between single market membership, customs union membership, and World Trade Organization rules, these issues are only being discussed and debated widely now when they should have been at the heart of public discussion well before the vote took place. Now, I don't pretend for one moment that the 2014 referendum was perfect. Of course it wasn't. But I do think it was a far better process for debate and decision than the 2016 vote on the EU was. And so we want to ensure that the next referendum on independence again gives people the information that they need to come to an informed and considered judgment. Uh, indeed, that's why nobody wants the referendum to take place immediately. Instead, I believe it should happen uh, once the details of the final Brexit agreement with the EU are known. Uh, and based on what the Prime Minister says currently, that is likely to be in late 2018 or early 2019. And of course, well before the referendum debate, the Scottish Government will also set out proposals for what an independent Scotland would look like. We will address issues such as the currency, uh, our plans for fiscal stability and the process of securing our relationship with Europe in future. And we will do all of that with as much detail and clarity as possible. But the second point I want to make relates to the tone of debate. And again, I make this uh, in the context of a Scottish referendum, but it has wider applicability. Uh, by and large, and on the whole, I think that the 2014 referendum was a very positive experience for Scotland. Uh, but I know that it didn't feel that way for everybody in Scotland. Now, in my view, a referendum is the only way of resolving Scotland's future constitutional status. However, one consequence of a referendum, wherever it takes place, is that it requires a binary choice, a yes or a no, from people who often have nuanced or even conflicting views about something that matters very deeply to them. Everyone in Scotland knows from our own experiences in 2014, although this is a point that is usually completely lost, that there was often very little difference between a no voter who was tempted by the ability to take a new path, but who had anxieties about the future, and a yes voter who felt solidarity with the rest of the UK, but who felt that ultimately Scotland would be better off if we were able to take decisions for ourselves. Uh, the polarisation that often seems to exist between politicians rarely exists within the public at large. And fundamentally, all voters simply want the best for their own families, for their own communities, and for their countries. They just come to different conclusions about how best to achieve that. So the campaign around Scottish independence needs always to respect that fact. We need to recognise the honesty and the validity of people's anxieties, doubts, and differences of opinion. And of course, as First Minister, I have a responsibility to lead by example. After all, the Scottish Government has a special responsibility to build consensus where we can. So I will do my best to ensure that all, at all times we make our case, not just with passion and conviction, but with 
courtesy, empathy and respect. And I hope very much that all politicians uh, will do the same. There is a, a lot of talk in Scotland right now about how an independence referendum would be divisive. But as the Church of Scotland said uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there is nothing inevitable about this campaign or any campaign being divisive. Campaigns in politics are only divisive if we make them so. Uh, and we should be determined, all of us, not to make it so. And as part of that, we should, of course, welcome rather than dismiss the contributions of experts, independent academic expertise, along with a free and vigorous media and strong civic institutions, form part of the lifeblood of a strong political community part of the lifeblood of a healthy, vibrant democracy. And that's something all politicians, regardless of our different views and opinions, should cherish and support rather than seek to denigrate, uh, even when it's not uh, always comfortable for us. Now, I mentioned at the outset of my remarks that this has been a tumultuous year. Uh, uncertain and challenging times, I think, demand the very best from politicians. We don't always live up to that, but all of us have a duty to strive to do so. But times like those we are living through right now also demand the very best of those whose job it is to try to understand and explain the events that are happening all around us. That's certainly true for the media, but I think it's also true for academics. In many ways, this must be a fascinating uh, and invigorating time to work in political studies. But I'm sure it's also a pretty challenging time to do so as well. And so I hope that this conference has played some part in helping you to rise to the challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day working lives. I hope that it has helped you as you scrutinize, analyze, inform, and enlighten. Because when you do that, and when you do it well, as you so often do, you are enriching public life and you are strengthening democratic debate. Uh, so that's why I am so genuinely delighted to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, I hope you have had a great time in Glasgow. I hope you've learned a lot about the political situation here in Scotland, just as you will have taught us uh, much about the political events elsewhere that you know best. So I wish all of you uh, the very best for the remainder of your conference. And now I look forward, I think, uh, to answering some of your questions. Thank you very much indeed. controversial questions to get us going. Um, Paula, much as I would like to agree with you, I'm not sure I could in all honesty say that your, uh, your, your question is, is strictly accurate. Um, and I don't think it is becoming for any politician to talk about their popularity uh, or otherwise. Um, I, I take a very simple uh, approach to politics. Uh, and, you know, I, I wouldn't stand here and say I always manage to live up to this. But ever since I've first been an elected politician, I've always thought the most important thing any politician can do is speak their mind and try to be clear and honest about what they believe in, to try to argue from the heart as well as the, the head. Um, and while all politicians uh, indulge and spin from time to time, uh, to concentrate in trying to put forward uh, your own view uh, based on what you really believe in uh, and let people judge. Uh, and I think sometimes people will have more respect for a politician, even if they don't agree with them, if they feel that they are arguing the case from principle and from conviction. Uh, and that's what I'll try to do. It served me reasonably well so far, uh, and I'll try to, to keep doing that. I think the worst thing uh, for any politician is to uh, just blow with the wind uh, and to change their opinion based on what they think people want to hear. Of course, you've got to listen to public opinion, especially if you're first minister, uh, but I think people uh, respond well to frankness and to honesty, and that's uh, the principle I will continue to, to try to abide by. Um, Andy, or at least Andy won, since there was two Andys uh, asked the question. Um, I, the European Union, well, firstly, 
it is an issue of principle at the heart of this for Scotland. And I think it's an issue of principle that can unite people whether they are for or against the EU. And that issue of principle is, if Scotland is to be in or out of the EU, that should surely be a decision for people in Scotland, not a decision that is taken for us. Scotland voted to stay in the EU, and I think it's wrong democratically that we face the prospect of leaving against our will. Uh, and that's a, an issue of principle that, that goes much further than just the issue of European Union membership. Uh, but on the issue of that, the EU is at its heart, and I should say, I, although I support EU membership, I, I'm not an uncritical uh, champion of the EU. I think there's lots about the EU that is wrong and badly needs reformed. But at its heart, it is uh, a coming together of independent countries, uh, coming together to address challenges or to uh, seize opportunities that few countries in the modern world can do alone. Um, and I've never believed and, and have never accepted, because I, I think it defies logic, that Scotland being a member of the EU uh, somehow undermines or would undermine its independence as a country. You know, you don't go to France or, or, or Germany and uh, hear them say anything other than they are independent countries, although they are members of the EU. So uh, being independent in Europe is not, in my view, and never has been uh, a contradiction in terms. Uh, Andy, to uh, the voting age, uh, it was a, I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, but just to concentrate on this issue about the voting age for a second. When we first proposed lowering the voting age for the referendum, it wasn't unanimously supported. There was lots of opposition to it. Um, interestingly, though, by the time we got to the other side of the referendum, there was no opposition to it. Everybody who had opposed it suddenly realised that it had been a great idea because it educated and informed and engaged a whole generation in a way that would not have happened otherwise. Um, I tried to persuade David Cameron to do likewise for the EU referendum. Uh, he didn't take my advice. Uh, had he done so, uh, as I said earlier on, I think that result would have gone the other way and he'd probably still be Prime Minister uh, right now, which I'm not saying is an argument for it. It's just an observation. On your question, though, we don't have a statutory curriculum in Scotland, uh, and that's just a, a general comment. So we don't have aspects of our curriculum that are enshrined in, in statute. Uh, but there is a strong emphasis on, uh, in our curriculum, and we have a new curriculum in Scotland uh, called Curriculum for Excellence, and there's a strong emphasis on that in uh, not just feeding young people with, with knowledge, important though knowledge is, but in enabling young people to learn the skills to be uh, responsible, engaged citizens. And in our secondary schools, modern studies education is a really important part of that. So uh, that uh, is a responsibility that I think our schools take very seriously. But what we found in the referendum was that what made the real difference there was the relevance that it suddenly had for those who would vote in that referendum. Um, and it brought politics and public debate to life in a way that we would have probably struggled with that age group to do otherwise. So um, I'm a big advocate of votes at 16, not just for referenda, uh, but for elections. And in fact, for all elections now that we control uh, the franchise of in Scotland, voting age is 16. Um, next question, would an independent Scotland need a bigger parliament? Um, I think there's an argument that yes, it would, although that would be a matter uh, for the parliament itself to debate and to decide. Um, not necessarily a massively uh, bigger parliament, and I think there are equally arguments that would be uh, counter to that. There is some debate right now. Uh, the new presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament has set up a commission to look at reforms uh, that might be appropriate for the parliament, given the new powers that we are uh, currently implementing in Scotland. So it is a live debate already um, about the, the size of the parliament, the committee structure, and I'm sure it will continue uh, to be so. In short, yes, I think there is a case to be made, but I, I think we would have a, a fairly lively debate about it before the Parliament came to a decision. Uh, and lastly, Meryl, uh, the short answer to your question is, how do we get more women into, not, not just into politics, but into positions of standing for elected office? And there's no short answer to that. There's no magic bullet solution to that. I'll talk about my own party's experience. You've got to start at the very grassroots of your party. 
change the way you do things, make it more conducive and easier for women to take part. We've put a lot of effort into mentoring, but we've also taken, and this is the key point I want to make, which will be the controversial one, we've taken very hard measures uh, to make sure that where there are vacancies, we have all women shortlists. Uh, so we've done the hard things and the controversial things that have meant, although you quoted the 30% uh, figure from my party, it's uh, over 40% of council candidates for the upcoming election are women. Um, the Scottish Parliament's got a really good record here across uh, the, the parties, but a note of caution is that even in the Scottish Parliament, which is seen, I think, with some justification to be a bit of a world leader on gender balance, there's no room for complacency. Uh, the Scottish Parliament started at a pretty high level, went back, and is just sort of flatlining a little bit. And the message is, uh, I think, that the parties that took concrete steps to deal with gender balance are the ones that are holding it up. It's been dragged down uh, by, in, in the main, I don't want to make a pejorative party political comment here, it's just a statement of fact. The main opposition in the Scottish Parliament, uh, the Conservatives, are really letting the side down because they haven't done anything about gender balance and so their gender balance is appalling and it's uh, reducing and diluting the gender balance of the Parliament as a whole. Uh, so I think the message is clear. You've got to be serious about it. Uh, and you've got, even on a temporary basis, to be prepared to do the things that break down these barriers uh, that are not there because of any ability on the part of women or any lack of ability. They are institutionalized systemic barriers. And until we're prepared to tackle them head on, we're always going to have a problem. But I hope we're heading in the right direction.